Run. Hi everybody and welcome once again to On The Run. And yes, I am back in Manila and I'm staying at the lovely Solaire. Haven't been here for a while, it's fantastic. So thanks to the guys at Solaire. Just checked into the room, just flew from Hong Kong and got here a matter of an hour or so ago. Came into the room. They've got an oatmeal and banana smoothie here for me as a welcome drink. Not bad, quite nice. Anyway, so um, yeah, the run has begun again uh, to Manila and who knows where we come to next. Now, before I get into the stories of uh, this week, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, the two mads we had uh, uh, earlier, or actually last month, now that it's April, uh, on March the 20th at Akata Manila and on March the 26th at Sofitel Macau. Both fantastic events in very different ways. Akata Manila was packed, over 200 people, uh, just a great vibe, a great buzz there, everyone was happy. Uh, Akata Manila, boy, do they really turn it on when it comes to events. Um, they supplied entertainment for us. They uh, gave a, gave us a great space there at the Lunar Lounge. The food was awesome. Uh, they had a full barbecue outside, and there was also food inside as well. And it was just a great vibe and a, and a wonderful venue, really. So we did the Chairman's Lounge at Akata Manila a year ago. And then this year we did uh, Lunar Lounge. That was great. And then Sofitel Macau on... Uh, March 26, just six days later. Thanks to all the guys at Success Universe and Sofitel Macau. Another awesome venue uh, out on the uh, terrace there, the North Terrace, overlooking uh, the, the the waterway in between Macau and mainland China. Sunsets, beautiful views. Uh, it was just great. Another great, um, a great night, great atmosphere, and we were looked after really well by the guys at Sofitel Macau. I have to say so. Yeah, thank you to both of those organisations for putting us uh, in a position to give those two great mads. I mean, what fantastic hospitality is all I can say. And uh, just, yeah, really on the money, so fantastic. Anyway, let's move on. So the uh, the stories of the week, well, it's actually the stories of the two weeks, because we didn't have an on the run last week. Uh, there was a holiday or so. There was some reason we didn't. But, but anyway, uh, we are going to cover the last two weeks or so and we've got 10 great stories to talk to you about. Um, oh, by the way, I should also mention that Chairman Tengo was at the, you know, the Chairman of PADCOR, Chairman Alejandro H. Tengo, was there at the MAD event, and that just added uh, even more vibe to the uh, Carta Manila MAD. So we, we have to say thank you to PADCOR for making him available that evening. It was just fantastic. Anyway, so story number 10, and... Um, it's about Thailand. It's actually a really big story. It's only at number 10 because Thailand doesn't have a gaming industry. I tend to put those at the bottom. But uh, just one step away now from legalizing casinos, Thailand is. So So what's happened here is the second study has been done. There was, there's a new government in Thailand. So they commissioned a second study. Uh, and uh, the House of Representatives have, has now approved that study. Now, uh, the recommendations are a little bit different to the first study. Uh, no casinos adjacent to Bangkok. Uh, no particular number given, but there has been some talk of maybe up to eight. Uh, there will be a local uh, entry levy, but we don't know how much. A 17% tax on GGR, so not, not bad at all. Quite a, you'd have to say that's a low number, uh, looking around the region, around the APAC region. So what happens now is it goes on up to cabinet and the new prime minister there, uh, Seta Tavison, has um, has already approved. So now it has to just go through his cabinet. And if so, I believe then uh, a bill gets drafted and hopefully we make a law and the law gets passed and away we go from there. So, you know, that's a great big story and a really uh, important development. If Thailand gets casinos, wow, that's going to have an effect on Cambodia Perhaps it may have an even an effect on Singapore, um, but I don't think so. 
All right, number nine, the largest ever WPT Korea. Uh, there was a WPT World Poker Tour event in Korea uh, just finished, and they had, believe it or not, over 4,000 entries. for. And this is not even a main tour stop. This is just a, a smaller event. So uh, 4,000 entries, uh, over 1,000 entries for the main event. The prize pool for the main event was almost $2 million and the prize pool, the total prize pools for all the events uh, was $5.6 million uh, US dollars. So uh, not bad at all, uh, really starting to get up there. Uh, so the main, uh, main tour stops for the WPT in Asia are Cambodia in January uh, and now Macau, of course. WPT has now announced that they're going to do an event in Macau. It's in June, so uh, starting on the 18th of June. And of course, Australia as well in, in September. So Adam Pliska, the CEO of the WPT, uh, IAG interviewed him in December. Actually, Ben went over to Las Vegas to, and interviewed him at uh, Wynn Resorts during a big WPT event there. And he, he was very enthusiastic about Macau. Now, little were we to know that, uh, just checking the mic is on, uh, little were we to know that uh, just six months later, a WPT Macau would be announced. So that's very exciting. And that's going to be at Wynn. It's going to be at uh, Wynn and Macau. So uh, I guess they've already got the connection from Wynn Resorts for their big December event they have uh, each year now. Well, I think it's two years. I may be wrong about that, but at least two years they've had this big event in Las Vegas at Wynn every December. And uh, that's growing in stature. So that's exciting. And it matches the Macau government's desire to bring more foreigners to Macau because poker, as we know, attracts people from all over the, uh, the world. And, and this event in Macau would definitely attract people from all over the world, but particularly people from all over Asia. Uh, number eight, so uh, Genting Chairman KT Lim has said that the developmental works at Resorts World Tentosa will begin this year. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar project, I think something like five billion to be spent in total. It's gonna be rolled out over eight years and it's just a, a great opportunity. In fact, KT Lim himself said uh, it was an incredible opportunity to upscale. Uh, and so Tan Sri Lim uh, made these comments in the annual report, the 2023 annual report that came out. Uh, this is gonna add 700 keys to Resorts World Sentosa. So that's a great asset. And there's also a, an enormous amount of other things that they're gonna to do, too, too numerous to mention right now, but I'm sure we'll be doing some stories on it and go into detail on all the things that they're gonna to do to improve Resorts World Sentosa, uh, presumably to try and compete with Marina Bay Sands. So that's great for Singapore. Uh, number seven, uh, well, let's get to Australia. Boy, it's always uh, there's always news in Australia lately. Our star CEO, uh, and this is Star Entertainment, the whole group, the CEO, uh, the top guy, Robbie Cook, fell on his sword, and he stepped down with immediate effect amid ongoing suitability concerns for the property. Look, to be honest, there's been grumblings behind the scenes about this for some time. I've been hearing a lot of things. We haven't been public about that. We just wanted to see how things played out. Uh, we don't report rumors, we only report facts. And uh, yeah, but it turns out in this case, the rumor was a fact. So uh, Robbie Cook actually came out and said he believed that as long as he was CEO, Star wouldn't be found suitable or was less likely to be found suitable. So was he criticizing himself? No, of course he wasn't. He was criticizing the regulator. He was saying the, the regulator had a, had, a, had a certain view and so he fell on his sword. So this is uh, bad news for Star. They have a second Bell inquiry. I question why Bell again. Uh, surely you would get somebody else to get a bit of variety, get some different points of view, get some diversity of opinion. Then again, uh, the regulator, uh, Philip Crawford, might be thinking, well, if the same guy does the inquiry, he already is knowledgeable about it for whatever reasons, I suppose. Uh, Queen's Wharf, of course, is delayed or will soon be delayed. I can't quite remember. This is the, the property that they have up in Brisbane. Uh, and how long before the Australian media gets wind of the fact that there's a significant Chinese ownership there and makes a huge deal out of that? I'm sure it's definitely going to happen at some point. Look, Star's in a mess. Uh, the chairman's now had to become an executive chairman and jump into the CEO role. Never a good thing. And I mean, the skills to be a chairman, the skills to be a CEO are different. 
uh, it's got to be sold, in my view. The only thing that Star can do is be sold lock, stock and barrel to a Blackstone, to, to well, maybe Crown down in Melbourne. We'll get to Crown in a minute. Maybe, a, who knows, an MGM or a Galaxy or a... I mean, Australia and China are in the good together now. Is Everything's all right geopolitically, right? Um, I mean, who knows? Who knows? So, but all I know is it's got to be sold. I think that's the only that's the only real result there. Uh, number six, Crown. Uh, great, big congratulations to Crown. Uh, back to suitability. What a big decision for them. Uh, um, what's her name? Fran Thorne. Yeah, Fran Thorne, the... The uh, the chair of the VG Triple C, the regulator there, gave a forty minute press conference. You can find it on asgam.com on IAG. Uh, you can find we've got it embedded in the, the story, the opinion story I wrote. Actually, I wrote uh, that day when it happened. Uh, um, the I wrote an opinion story and embedded the video. Quite an interesting video to watch if you've got a spare forty minutes, or maybe thirty minutes or twenty seven minutes or something, put it on one and a half speed. Um, it's quite interesting, quite an interesting press conference, the things that she says and some of the questions she gets asked by the Australian media. Uh, but the company came out and said it's one of the most significant milestones in its history. Well, of course it is. Uh, you know, it was an existential crisis for Crown and they've come through it. So many many of you watching this know that the Crown Resort CEO, Kieran Carruthers, from his time in Macau, Congratulations to Kieran, what a tough gig and how he's come out the other side. What a great job, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. So, you know, we wish him the best. And now really he's basically struggled his way to the starting line. He's had two two years or so of, of, of struggling his way to the starting line and now he can maybe start to run a company. So anyway, interesting, well, well done to Crown. You know, they were in a mess, they did a lot of bad things and uh, they've remediated themselves and it was asked, Fran Thorne was asked, you know, what would they have to have done to lose their license? And she said, well, they would have had to not do the work they've done. They've done a lot of work. I and mean, let's be honest, it's a different owner, a different board, a different management, different CEO. I mean, it's a totally different company. I think the only thing the same about it is the name and the location, but the, uh, the people are very, very different. Uh, number five, Macau confirms that it wants RFID or chip in chip technology for all table games. It's not mandating it, it's not forcing it, but they've come out and said we want it. Uh, so that's really, really interesting because if that is the case and you have RFID chips, you can, in theory, track everything. We can track table games like a slot machine or like an ETG. Uh, yeah, we can track players' bets. So gone, in theory, would be the days of rolling. You could just track it through the... Through the, um, through the um, I don't want to say the, the brand name that everybody uh, is mostly used uh, because I want to be generic as to type, but uh, through a, a table that has data, let's say that. Um, and what about the interesting big data implications of this? If, with all that data, I mean, what can you do with the analysis and the optimization, the calculations you can do with all that data? So interesting. So yeah, the cows come out and said they want it. I think it's only a matter of time before it's going to become the standard around the world, to be honest. But the question is, will it stay as RFID chips or will we get some kind of AI with cameras, some kind of camera like, like uh, you know, Google self-driven cars? I mean, they're driving cars based upon camera input. So, you know, could, could it be that? I think that maybe that might be the more advanced technology, but I'm sure the RFID guys don't think that, and I'm sure they have their answers to that, and they would know more than me about it. So I'd be very interested to know their views on that, actually. Uh, number four, Palazzo Versace Hotel opened at uh, GLP, Grand Lisboa Palace. Uh, Donatella Versace herself came down uh, to Macau and uh, helped open it, and this is the, the culmination of many, many, many years of development of Grand Lisboa Palace. And now to see the Versace Hotel open there is great for them. Um, you know, there were real changes afoot at SJM, now with Ben Toe as the uh, COO. Uh, Ben's a very, very likable chap, and he is uh, somebody who's got experience. He's been at Sands, he's been around the traps. He's also quite aware of... Um, 
you know, how to run companies. He's, he's had a time at GE. Um, so he's aware of the sort of, you know, the modern day, the modern methods of running companies and getting the best out of companies. And that's exactly what SJ needs, isn't it? So uh, will he be able to get through the, the in, any potential pushback from the old school at SJM? Well, I think people at SJM realise that they have to change. So maybe, yeah, maybe he will. So good luck to them. And we want to see a healthy SJM. We want to see a, a profitable SJM. We want to see a profitable GLP, our Grand Lisboa Palace. So it's great that the Versace Hotel was open. So their, their product is that much higher now. And uh, good luck to Ben Toe. Uh, now, what do we got here? Number three. Oh, yes, of course, the Macau GGR. Highest, just by a smidgen, uh, the high, by by two million patakas, so by a quarter of a million US dollars for the month, uh, by a smidgen, the highest uh, GGR month since uh, we reopened from the pandemic on the 8th of January 2023. Uh, it came in at 19.503. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, uh, correctly, a billion patakas, which is about 2.4 billion US. So that's a run rate of uh, 2.4, so that's 7.2 a quarter. So it's at 28.8, uh, so call it 29. Well, I could even call it 30. Pushing, let's say pushing 30, pushing 30 billion US a year. Uh, and is it a standard month? Let's think about it for a second here. March, it's a 31-day month, but it doesn't have any holiday in it. So, but then again, it's not. Doesn't have a dead spot in it either, probably. So it's probably a pretty indicative month, I guess. So yeah, maybe we will get close to 30 billion US this year. I, th I think so. So that's great for Macau. Um, number two, uh, MGM China declared a special dividend uh, after notching up its $337 million profit in 2023. Well, I think MGM China has been the story of uh, 2023 and 2024 so far. I think there's a lot of angst going on in Macau from MGM's competitors about what MGM is doing. Well, firstly, they've got an extra 198 tables, so that helped, well, let's call it 200 tables uh, in the, uh, the new concessions that began on the 1st of January, 2023. So that's obviously a massive advantage. Uh, and, but they're doing other things as well. If you go talk to the guys at MGM, which I have, uh, I occasionally have sit downs with this very, very most senior guys there and have just a general chat with them about how how they're going and what they're doing. And they will tell you things like changing the floor. Uh, yeah, look, it might sound funny, but they're giving away haagen on the floor. Um, people like haagen -Dazs. They're giving away, is it popcorn? I think they're giving away, I might have that wrong. I think it's popcorn as well. They're giving away on the floor, but they're definitely giving away haagen ice cream. Uh, interesting and they're just doing other things as well mgm actually so interesting so the yeah the main thing the main story here is that they declared this dividend and um small dividend but it was a year earlier than expected according to jp morgan the analysts there and it sends a great message it sends a great message about macau so now that's galaxy started paying dividends last year uh, MGM paid a dividend and Win Win paid a small dividend as well out of their 2023 profits, which I think were only 100 and something, 157 million. Don't hold me to that um, for the 2023 year. But if dividends can be paid out of the 2023 year, which was really one of the comments that JP Morgan made was it was really only half a year in a way because the first half of the year was ramping up. Uh, that, that augurs very, very well for the future, doesn't it? Uh, they mentioned that they expected, JP Morgan, they mentioned they expected Sands to join the party next year to pay a dividend in 2025 out of 2024 profits. Isn't it nice to say profits again? Uh, and they expected Melco and SJM to not pay dividends and to focus on getting their debt down because they have significant uh, significant debt that they need to they need to address. I mean, their leveraging during the pandemic was was something to behold but it had to be done and number one this uh week i think was a great story bill hornbuckle from mgm resorts uh, went and met xi jinping in a contingent of american businessmen there were 20 american businessmen i know there was only one businessman allowed per business so obviously other people went with them but with the actual meeting with xi jinping it was just one person per business 20 businesses 20 20 businessmen met Xi Jinping and, and some of his 
some of his uh, offsiders, for want of a better word. I think Wang Yi was there. I think a few others were there. Uh, but that's great. So is this a signalling, a thawing? I mean, this is the intention was to signal a thawing of uh, relations between the US and China. Um, but you know, the thing that I think is fantastic about it is what a great signal it sends to Macau. I mean, China doesn't do anything without thinking about it, right? Nothing is by accident. And the fact that Bill Hornbuckle, a Amer very American businessman who uh, runs a casino in Macau indirectly or directly, he's chairman, um, obviously Pansy's in there too, uh, but the fact that he's there meeting Xi Jinping in the same room in the, I think it was, it was at the East Hall of the Great Hall of the People or whatever in Beijing. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And that Xi Jinping, you know, giving a vote of confidence to Macau, I think, I think that's a really good signal for Macau. And I think after, you know, we don't really have the junkets anymore. I know there's a few small ones hanging around, but we don't have them anything like we had them before. We've cleaned up our act. The new concessions have gone through. This uh, diversification pushes on. China really wants that. And Macau's really, really doing it, or at least trying, trying to do it. I think all of that uh, is a big green tick for Macau in the eyes of China. And they like what Macau is a lot more than they did three or four years ago when it was capital flight, capital flight, and you know money crossing the border and all of that. And uh, I think a mass mar you know, the mass market we've got now in Macau, a mass market dominated uh, model rather than a VIP dominated model is much more to China's liking. So yeah, congratulations to Bill Hornbuckle. What an exciting experience that must have been to meet Xi Jinping. So, I mean, say what you like to say about Xi Jinping, good, bad, or, or any other world leader. I'm not casting aspersions on anyone. Um, but, you know, to meet someone so powerful and uh, one of the absolute handful of top world leaders must have been quite exciting and quite interesting so uh yeah yeah very very good congratulations to bill hornbuckle congratulations to mgm being the ones uh to be up there to do that all right well that's the end of uh on the run for this week just um a little a little update on my travels i've just left today uh left macau this morning it's uh thursday late afternoon or early evening the sun is setting here in uh, Manila, the sun's coming down. I'm looking out the window over there. It's, it looks very, very pretty indeed. I, oh, what a shame I can't show you. I'm not going to turn the camera around. But uh, the sun is setting. It's late afternoon here in Manila. And uh, I went Macau, Hong Kong, Manila today. I'll be down to Australia in about five or six days from now, going down to Melbourne. And then a bunch of other travel, a potential travel. Uh, so I'm thinking about going to... Saigon, Singapore, uh, to KL, um, Vietnam as well. Oh, I said Vietnam, I said Saigon, didn't I? Sorry, Ho Chi Minh City, I should say, not Saigon. Um, I might even get over to Perth, might get up to Sydney from Melbourne, don't know. Uh, all of that will be ex Australia and then back to Australia. I'll be back in Melbourne, then I'll be up to Manila again in the last week of May and then over to. Um, over to Hong Kong and finally back to Macau at the very end of May is the plan now. Um, so yeah, quite a long run. So I will see you next week for On The Run. Enjoy your weekend. Have a great time. Keep visiting asgam.com and enjoy. See you next time. Bye. Run.